Back in 2016, I presented a talk exclusively for attendees of the Church of Satan's 50th anniversary celebrations. And now, in celebration of Satan's Plane's first anniversary, I present that same talk to you. It's a presentation I call Spotlights, Dim Bulbs, and Shine. Up next on Satan's Plane. Well, it's not Satan worship, it's Satanism. It's embracing the life enriching things which have traditionally been given the devil's name. Pride, lust, earthly success, rational self-interest, atheism, humor, nonconformity, science, a passion for living, being selective about whom we love. We don't see these as shameful sins, but empowering ideals. And we also recognize the psychological power and fun of symbolism and aesthetics, so we utilize Satan as mythology's most fitting mascot for what we're about. Satan Splain. Satanic Talk with Church of Satan Magister Bill M. Magister Bill M. here with episode number 40 of Satan's Plane. As I record this, it is right around the one-year anniversary of the show, so I thought I would present one of many different themes I was planning on doing eventually on the show. To give you the backstory on this, the year 2016 marked the 50th anniversary for the Church of Satan, so in celebration of that... We had a whole weekend of activities in New York, which is where the current Black House, the administrative headquarters, is located. Actually, you could say that the celebrations started a whole year before that in 2015. That calendar year 2015 was year 50. Remember, folks, 1966 was year one Anasotanus, not year zero. So... First, in 2015, there was a convention in Washington, D.C. with different events. I attended that, the limited edition release of the Satanic Bible and Satanic Rituals together in hardcover. That was unboxed that weekend. Uh, There was entertainment. There was a whole host of presentations from different Church of Satan members. So fast forward to Walpurgis Nacht 2016 the actual 50th anniversary of the Church of Satan's founding. This time, the events were in New York, and as I mentioned, I think in the previous Satan's Plane episode, I myself got to do some musical performances that weekend. But also, there was a panel of talks from Church of Satan hierarchy members, including myself. I was one of the guest speakers that day. I had the opportunity to talk to a live audience of Church of Satan members about something. And when you have that opportunity, the big question is, what the hell do you talk about? It seemed like a -a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity for me, so I'm thinking, okay, what do I talk about? There are any number of Satanism subtopics I can talk about on a stage for 20 minutes. I mean, you know that, listening to Satan's Plane. So, as I said to the live audience that day, right at the start, I said, you know, I was first and foremost grateful to just have the opportunity to speak at this historic event. And yes, there was no shortage of things I could have talked about, but for this event, there were two things I kept in mind. One, this is the Church of Satan's 50th anniversary. I don't know if I'd ever have the opportunity to speak in front of a, you know, an auditorium, entire auditorium of Church of Satan members in person again. So I wanted to pick something that would be relatable and more specifically about the Church of Satan itself, maybe about membership in the Church of Satan itself. And the other important thing was I had a limited amount of time on stage, so I knew I had to get something that was prepared and focused and rehearsed. Because if you've ever had to do a lecture or a presentation before in a fixed amount of time, then you know firsthand that trying to get all of your PowerPoint slides and your points in before the end is a whole challenge itself. And there are little differences you have to do, I would say, when delivering a talk, um, you know, live versus doing a podcast like this versus doing a written article. I mean, in theory, you could write an article, read it word for word on stage at a podium or record yourself reading it word for word on a podcast. But I would argue there are little nuances with those in terms of delivery and structure and the like. So what you'll hear in this episode is not the actual recording from that day. I do have the actual recording, complete with the PowerPoint slides and other stuff. It ended up being not even 20 minutes total, including the MC's introduction of me. (laughs) But uh, rather than give you a recording of that rushed satanic TED Talk lecture of mine, I thought for Satan's Plane, 
I would give you an expanded version of what I talked about that day. So I'm going to give you the same content, the same points that I made. But uh, you know, I'm going to elaborate here and there, not give it a, as a rushed 20-minute PowerPoint presentation. So let us begin. The title of this talk is Spotlights, Dim Bulbs, and Shine. I came up with this title as I reflected on my experiences as a Church of Satan member, which by the time of the talk I was giving in 2016 had totaled almost 20 years. And in summary, what I'll be presenting is a set of some observations I've had about Church of Satan members, as well as certain ex-members, including certain recurring trends that I've seen with them over the years. And after the break, I'm going to finish off with some advice for fellow Satanists and members of the Church of Satan. Now, it's worth pointing out that uh, I've written a lot about the Church of Satan. Uh, I've written a lot about Church of Satan membership in my essay, Satanism is Not a Congregational Religion. You can read that essay on churchofsatan.com. For that matter, those of you who are listening to this on Satan Splain can listen to episode number 17 of Satan Splain, where I talk about the general topic too. So quickly to summarize some of the points I made both in the essay and in that Satan's Plane episode, we described the Church of Satan as a cabal, or sometimes as a mutual admiration society. People who demand to know what the organization does seemingly don't realize that we are not a political lobbying group, we're not a regular social organization. The Church of Satan is made up of its members. And that's actually what the true meaning of the word church is. The word church, it's not necessarily a physical building, but the body of people affiliated through the principles and convictions that they have in common. And when it comes to Satanism, some of those principles include rational self-interest and being your own god. As has been said, Satanism is a tool, not a cause. So if you want to see what the Church of Satan is doing, you don't look at what the central office is doing. You don't look at what we do in the name of Satanism as a collective. Rather, you look at what our individual members are individually doing. And as I told the audience that day in 2016, anybody who attended the other presentations and events for the 50th anniversary can see that the Church of Satan has many incredible individuals doing amazing things with their lives. So I can't state that enough. However, there are certain trends, like I've said, there are certain trends I've noticed with many members over the years, and this brings me to the title of this talk, Spotlights, Dim Bulbs, and Shine. Let me explain each of those three terms. When I say spotlights, by spotlights I'm referring to Church of Satan members who seem to be in the spotlight at a given time. So these are the members who seem to be notably popular, among other members, and maybe among Satanists in general, pretty well known by name. They're doing a lot of creative projects. They have a notable online presence. Their name keeps showing up in the Church of Satan newsfeed. They're doing interviews with the media. So they're in the spotlight. But then, say, five or ten years later, there may, may come a time where they're virtually unknown to most Satanists, strangely enough. Obviously, nobody stays in the spotlight forever, whatever the scene is, whether it's Satanism or something else. But what about these members who were once on top of the world, but have seemingly fallen off the face of the earth? So that's something I wonder about. I think that's worth exploring. And the next term in the title is dim bulbs. A dim bulb is what I call the sort of person who thinks they understand Satanism, but at the end of the day, really doesn't. You know, they're, they're pretty dim. And I don't mean obvious examples. I'm not talking about you know, Christian proselytizers or devil worshippers or Illuminati seekers from Nigeria. I'm also not talking about Satanists who are new to Satanism and understand the basics, but, you know, maybe they have a few questions about some topics or there are a couple things they haven't mentally pieced together and, you know, put together yet. That's perfectly understandable. You know, we've all been there. But on the other hand, there's the person who seems to understand Satanism enough to call themselves a Satanist, maybe. And they say they've read the Satanic Bible. 
They may or may not not end up uh, joining the Church of Satan even, but regardless, they just don't get it. You know, they seem to understand some parts of Satanism, yet they completely miss the boat when it comes to certain aspects, uh, certain other aspects of Satanism. They may even decide to become haters of the Church of Satan because of what they don't understand or some stupid drama with other members. Uh, in, In fact, in some extreme cases, you may see some of these people that go from spotlight to dim bulb in a matter of years. Fortunately, uh, not all go down that road of no return, and also fortunately, not all dim bulbs are hopeless cases. Let's talk a little bit more about that. And this brings me to the third term I use here after spotlights and dim bulbs, which is shine. So extending the analogy with lights, or lack of lights, on upstairs. In the final part of this talk, I'm going to talk about shine, how Satanists might shine. And by that, I mean maximizing their potential as Satanists, whether or not it lands them in the spotlight. A Satanist's potential to do outstanding things. So shine is a quality I would say not only separates the spotlights from the dim bulbs, but is something all Satanists can benefit from and All Satanists may find themselves wanting to strengthen from time to time. So now that I've given you the overview, let us first talk about Spotlight members of the Church of Satan. As I've said, these Spotlight members, these are high-profile members who become the talk of the town. They're always getting mentioned in the Church of Satan news feeds and get interviewed in the media and so on. Obviously, like I said, nobody stays in the Spotlight forever, but uh, people who were household names among Church of Satan members 10 or 15 or more years ago, uh, maybe largely unknown now in some cases. So what happened to these people? Well, there's any number of answers. Um, Did they quit? In some cases, yeah. We have had people over the years. I've seen some people over the years who quit the Church of Satan. Um, Our detractors would like to believe that this happens left and right, and it's some kind of sort of detrimental problem the Church of Satan has. Um, It's not, but the number isn't zero either. So why might somebody quit the Church of Satan, whether or not they were really active and in the spotlight in the first place? Well, I would say one of the reasons somebody might quit the Church of Satan is the same reason why anybody would quit a particular religion, and that is they have a change in religious beliefs. We've had some people say, hey, you know, I've had these changes in my life that made me change my religious views to the point where I can no longer honestly consider myself a Satanist. I'm something else now, so I hereby resign my Church of Satan membership. To which we say, okay, well, thank you for at least being honest to both us and yourself. We will terminate your membership per your request. You see, the Church of Satan is not a cult, so if somebody in our organization doesn't want to be part of us anymore, there's no point in trying to make them stay. So I have seen this happen a few times over the years, people who quit out of religious differences. And I have to say, those people typically part on good terms without any drama on the way out. Now, are Church of Satan members allowed to be friends with ex-members? Yeah, you can. Again, we're not a cult. If you want to associate with those people still, you can. Of course, keep in mind that when somebody decides to quit the Church of Satan, their membership benefits should end there as well. So even if you leave the organization on good terms, I would say don't expect the rest of us to necessarily support your work or promote you on our channels or interview you on a our podcasts, network with you on other things, and so on, like we do with other members, because, again, we can end on good terms, but it does mean ending it. There's no sense in giving the benefits of membership to people who aren't members. So that's one thing that may explain why a member is no longer in the spotlight. They end up quitting the organization. This isn't the typical case, though. Most of the members I can think of who were in the spotlight and no longer are Well, they are, in fact, still members. They're just perhaps more private than they used to be. For example, a good friend of mine is a priest in the Church of Satan. I won't say his name, but 20 years ago, he was definitely in the spotlight, and he was the talk of the town. But 
He's also in the military and has been advancing really high in rank in that career of his. So at some point, he had to simply say, uh, yeah, guys, I don't really want to show my face on public television anymore as a Satanist talking about Satanism because that could, you know, work against me at this point. And to that we say, fine, that's perfectly understandable. There's nothing satanic about being a martyr, so we don't make any demands on members to out themselves if they feel that it's not in their best interest. To give another example, I can think of some Satanists who've decided to get involved in politics. So yeah, obviously they've decided uh, not to be so public about their Satanism anymore. Now, there are also Church of Satan members who were in the spotlight but then just had other priorities in life come up, um, even if they could afford to be public. So, you know, they didn't stop doing things out of a need for secrecy, but maybe just time constraints or what they decided was more important uh, with their lives, what they decided to do. Some Satanists become parents and have had to say, well, I'd like to keep doing this satanic artwork thing that I do for people and this satanic music project and doing this thing for this message board, but... Yeah, we just had another child, and I really have to put those projects on the shelf and focus on raising a family and being a parent. That's my new project that I have to do. Once again, perfectly understandable. Now, to be clear, not every successful Church of Satan member necessarily comes to the spotlight in the first place. Like I said, some Church of Satan members aren't really in a position to be all that public about what they're doing with their lives in the first place, and, uh, broadcasting it on the satanic news feeds. I know some Church of Satan members who are doing great work with artificial intelligence and robotics and pentagonal revisionism, but uh, don't necessarily want to advertise where they work and what they're doing because they don't need the harassment <laughs> from Christians or from other people. Never mind the fact that some members don't feel the need to report their life activities to other Church of Satan members. I mean, I myself don't broadcast everything I'm doing with my life. I don't even do that on social media, let alone the Church of Satan newsfeed. I mean, this stuff I'm doing with my daytime work career or my home projects or whatnot, but not all of that is satanic news, really, so you know, I don't report it. In fact, as I've said on Satan's Plane before, some Church of Satan members decide they don't have as much of an interest in the social opportunities that Church of Satan membership might give them. Maybe some have become more recluse with age. I know some members who are not even on social media. They're not on Facebook. They've never had Facebook. They don't want to have anything to do with Facebook or Twitter or TikTok or whatever. Yeah, folks, imagine that. Not every Satanist is on social media, let alone actively and wanting to talk to you. In fact, as I was presenting this talk to everybody that day at the Church of Satan's 50th anniversary, I pointed out the fact that there are members who just didn't want to be there that actual day by choice. They're great members in good standing, but... They didn't necessarily want to attend a conclave. They didn't want to fly out to New York that particular weekend, and that's fine. One final observation I'd like to give as to where these spotlight members may disappear to. In some cases, they just disappear, and we have no idea what happened to them. They stop corresponding, and we can't get in touch with them. I can think of... A few cases where that happened, uh, the earliest example I remember seeing firsthand was from about 20 years ago. On, on Radio Free Satan, there was a DJ who went by the name Zuzu. She was from Brazil, if I recall. And she had a great little show on Radio Free Satan called Highball Digital Radio. Well, one week she didn't turn in an episode of her show... Then another week passed and another, and we wrote to her. We never heard anything back. We kept rerunning old episodes, and we kept asking around, you know, asking other Church of Satan members, hey, has anybody heard from Zuzu? Any, does she have another email address? So uh, finally, after months, she disappeared, and we had to pull the plug on her show. And, um, you know, what happened to her? Did she 
get into an accident with head trauma and see the image of Jesus on a cookie and become a crazy Christian? Did she elope to a hut in the Himalayas with somebody? Did she die? I don't know. Your guess is as good as mine. So in summary, with Spotlight members, these members who seem to be household names, among other Satanists, but seem to have disappeared, well, some quit for legitimate reasons. Most just decidedly just continue their work outside of the Spotlight. In some cases, they stop talking to us and we don't know what happened to them. Though also once in a very great while, some leave in a huff and make a stupid, dramatic exit. And some become so intolerable that they get kicked out. And this sort of thing happens with people who maybe aren't in the spotlight in the first place. And this brings me to the next topic, which is dim bulbs. So to reiterate what I said earlier, I'm not saying that any Church of Satan member who isn't popular in the spotlight must be some kind of idiot dim bulb. Obviously not. But again, there is this phenomenon of people who find their way to Satanism and even also to the Church of Satan. But in the end, it turns out they really don't grasp Satanism at all. Not so much the people who have a change in religious belief and leave on good terms. But I'm talking about those last examples I mentioned, of people who rage quit, if you will, or become such insufferable assholes that we have to boot them out. So how does this sort of thing happen? That's what I was wondering. Now, I know some Satanists out there will say, well, Bill, who cares about these people? They're gone. Don't worry about them. Don't talk about them. That's what they want. They're idiots. They couldn't hack it so good riddance. Okay, well, fair enough. But I'm at least curious on how that transition happens. How does somebody go from a Satanist who seems to understand Satanism, maybe even joins the Church of Satan, maybe even finds themselves in the spotlight doing these projects and interviews and all this stuff, and yet some years later they become an active hater of the Church of Satan? How does that happen? I know... If you talk to some of them, they will claim, oh, it's because the Church of Satan used to believe this and this and this, and now they don't anymore, and that's why they kicked me out, because they couldn't handle it. But, well, the evidence tends to show otherwise. I keep asking for evidence of the Church of Satan radically changing something it believed in, or to give an example of something a member could do or believe in back in 1996 that they can't believe or do today, or vice versa, and I never get an actual answer. So really, how might that sort of flip happen? Again, it's not some sort of detrimental thing happening to the organization every day, as much as some people would like to believe that. But it is a phenomenon I've seen, and maybe we can learn something from this. Maybe we can learn how to cut down on future drama. See the warning signs, you know, earlier on? I told the live audience that day in New York, I know that during the week of 6606, the, the, you know, the high mass, there was some drama that happened with a few members who are thankfully gone now, and I think we learned some things from that, which we applied to the 50th anniversary celebrations to make things run much smoother in terms of how we advertise and you know how people get together and so on. But to answer this question on how that kind of flip might happen, well, philosophically, can it even happen? I mean... If we say Satanists are born not made, then how is it that an ex-Satanist is even possible? Let alone the dim bulb ex-Satanist who gets half of it right and then misses the boat on the other half. Well, I would argue that the phrase, first, first of all, the phrase Satanists are born not made doesn't mean that a Satanist can't have a past as a non-Satanist. I mean, look at the chapter in the Satanic Bible, The God You Save May Be Yourself. That gives the hypothetical example of the person who goes through all these spiritual religions in an effort to rationalize away their primal core being until they finally come to the realization that, you know, there really is no spiritual, there's only the carnal, and they come to recognize themselves as Satanists. So to me, born not made, well, what that really means is that Satanism is a religion that just has to come naturally to you when it does happen. 
as opposed to a religion that anybody can convert to through submission. Because with most other religions in the world, people who really want to convert will convert. But it, it doesn't work like that in Satanism. You can't say, ooh, I, I really want to be a Satanist. I mean, I, I haven't read the Satanic Bible, and I don't know whether or not I agree with Satanism, but I, I just know I really, really want to be a Satanist, and, and I'll say or do whatever it takes to be one. No, it, you know, Satanism doesn't work like that. But going back to this phenomenon of dim bulbs, such as the uh, disgruntled ex-Church of Satan member who has an axe to grind with the Church of Satan, I have seen some recurring patterns in their behaviors and what they say. First of all, they've often reacted to other members, especially other Spotlight members, with jealousy. Now, some of you may say, but Bill, envy is one of the seven deadly sins, and the Satanic Bible says envy is good. Well, yeah, it does. But I didn't say envy, I said jealousy. Because you see, I'm, I personally make a very important distinction between envy and jealousy. Envy is indeed one of the seven deadly sins. It's a wonderful sin. It's the one we Satanists probably enjoy the least out of the seven. Because it doesn't feel so indulgent. It, it makes us feel uncomfortable. But we support envy because envy drives progress. I would say the difference between envy and jealousy is that envy is saying, wow, I really love that thing that you have. I don't have that. I want something like that for myself. Jealousy, on the other hand, is saying, wow, I really love that thing you have. I don't have that myself, and I don't want you to have that either. Likewise, you'll see these people who may get jaded when they're not being noticed for their own work, or they work really hard on something and put it out there, and it's not well-received for whatever reason. Or maybe they did something years ago that was really great, but they haven't, they haven't you know, done much since, and they're mad that most Satanists they talk to don't remember their past glories anymore. Maybe they were a Spotlight member once upon a time, but not many are old enough to remember it. Maybe there was a time, it was a time before a lot of current active members had joined. In some cases, I've noticed the dim bulb has some delusion of being the resident expert on some topic. And are shocked to find out that members of the Church of Satan may have gone ahead and did something on that topic without consulting them. In fact, I remember one particular guy who went out to California for the 6606 High Mass. But after it was already all planned, he felt insulted that it, you know, he wasn't consulted for it. I, I heard he actually said, quote, I thought I was the go-to guy for satanic ritual. Well, long story short, he's no longer with us, so uh, good riddance to him. Another phrase rooted in jealousy that I have heard dim bulbs say is, well, why did this member of the Church of Satan get elevated? I can't believe this person became a priest. Why did this person become a witch? That doesn't make any sense. What is so great about that person? That person's a moron. Well, as I told the audience that day, hey, I'm sure there were members who said those sorts of things about me. People who don't like me, don't know how I became a magister or something. And maybe a couple of them, I told the audience that day, maybe some of you are even in this audience I'm talking to right now, and that's fine. We're not all required to get along. But I have seen some members get elevated to witch or priest or magister or whatever, and I'll admit sometimes it happened with members where I didn't personally understand why it happened. There are people I maybe personally didn't like, and I didn't really understand why the Church of Satan thought they were deserving of that title. Often when a member gets elevated, you know, it, it is understandable. I'll find out somebody became a priest and I'll think like, wow, I thought you kind of were a priest already. I, I didn't realize. But, well, congratulations. And it makes perfect sense because you're a great member and so on. But, uh, you know, sometimes that doesn't happen. Well, to that, I would say, you know, just because you don't know why some member or another got an elevation, it doesn't mean they didn't earn it. You don't know. Again, not every member of the church uh, broadcasts their life's activities to other members. Maybe the member 
who got that elevation is doing something really big in the offline world and they never post about it on social media. Maybe they only shared the news with the central office. I know I've done stuff. I've, I've had personal accomplishments that I didn't want to make public news for practical reasons. There's some cases I shared it only with central. So if you see a member who gets a priesthood title or whatever, and you don't know why, well, then you don't know why. Who cares? Why do you care? Just mind your own business. Next slide, as I said to the audience at this point, a slide which started with a mention of the nine satanic sins, because when it comes to pinpointing where uh, people who think they're Satanists really miss the boat on Satanism, I think the nine sins are a definitive guide. And dim bulbs, of course, invariably exhibit one or more of the nine satanic sins. And I know many members, um, you know, many Satanists hearing this will immediately say, oh yeah, Bill, of course, the sin of stupidity. That's who we're talking about. Well, hang on, it's not just stupidity. Let's dig a little deeper in, into the list. I mean, take counterproductive pride, for example. That's certainly one that would describe some of the earlier examples I gave. Pretentiousness, that's another big one. But I would especially point out sin number six, lack of perspective. We might, you know, we say right in the list of the nine satanic, satanic sins that lack of perspective can lead to a lot of pain for Satanists. And also number three, which is solipsism. And we say explicitly in the list that this can be particularly dangerous for Satanists. So let's think about those two satanic sins for a moment, lack of perspective and uh, solipsism. One common theme that I see in a lot of these dim bulbs is developing the attitude that they're bigger than the Church of Satan. And the fact of the matter is, they're not. No single member is. And some might say, well, Bill, that's crazy because I'm a Satanist and that means I'm my own God. I'm the most important person in my life. Yeah, yeah, that's true. As a Satanist, you are the most important person in your life. You are the God of your life life, but to quote my friend Magister Michael Rose, just because you are your own god doesn't mean that you are everybody else's god. You can see this even in mythology. Was Zeus bigger than the Parthenon? No. And even he knew that. Gods are not omnipotent. I know people like to attribute omnipotence as a quality of gods but it really isn't. In fact, every story about gods from mythology is precisely about some god who runs into limitations. A god runs into problems, trying to be bigger than themselves and control more than what they can, and tragedy strikes. You may be the center of your life as a Satanist, but that does not make you the center of the Church of Satan. Because other Church of Satan members have their lives, and you're not the center of those lives. This doesn't mean that we never disagree or debate with each other, or that uh, we can't point out behavior that's definitively anti-Satanic. But again, you are not bigger than the Cabal. But of course, it's this kind of narcissism of people who think otherwise, uh, you know, that kind of narcissism which I've seen driving this sort of dim bulb behavior, driving these sorts of people to do, for example, uh, you know, they'll lose an argument on a message board and they'll turn around and say, well, I'm not going to associate with the Church of Satan. I'm going to form a new satanic organization. I shall call it the first uh, mosque of Lucifer reformed and I'll be the high priest because I clearly know what Satanism is and I have more insight than the Church of Satan who has been at this since before I was born. But, uh, you know, by forming my own group, I'm being truly satanic anyway, when you think about it, right? I mean, Anton would respect what I'm doing. N not that I ever met Anton LeVay. He, he died before I was old enough to drive a car. But I know what he would have wanted better than his actual living friends do. And I am my own god. I am an I theist. No. No, no. You are not an I theist. You are a clinical narcissist. And you are stupidly trying to reinvent the wheel in an attempt to rationalize away the parts of Satanism you don't understand. 
You are not more satanic in your setting up of an Instagram page or setting up a Twitter channel and calling it a satanic organization. You are a pretentious loser. You do not have some sort of keen insight that the Church of Satan was somehow too big and clumsy to miss. You are a solipsist. And you are not a nonconformist. You are not an outsider. You are socially retarded. But let's get back and uh, expand on one of those parts I said, the idea of thinking that you know better than what the Church of Satan does regarding Satanism. You see this sometimes with people new to Satanism. You see some people who say, yeah, the Church of Satan really needs to bring back the grotto system, or the Church of Satan should openly condone illegal drugs because, you know, it's a personal choice and indulgence, and that makes it a satanic thing to do. Well, these sorts of people, though, don't realize that there are very good reasons why the Church of Satan no longer does certain things it used to do or never started in the first place. Some things are things we've tried and we stopped doing because it proved to be counterproductive or we, we came up with better alternatives, you know, like the grotto system. But with some other things, we don't do them because if you stop and think about it and think it through, it's kind of a bad idea. I've talked about those particular examples on previous Satan's Plane episodes, but to quickly sum it up, yeah, we had grottos before and found in the end that they were more trouble than they were worth. Church of Satan members don't need a formal grotto to network and do things together, even locally. The Devil's Reign art shows in Florida, for example, they didn't need a grotto to function. I've done plenty of group rituals with fellow Church of Satan members without needing a grotto to do it. And things like condoning, condoning illegal drugs or any other illegal activities, well, any organization that explicitly does that is just asking for trouble. As if we don't have enough problems with law enforcement breathing down the neck of the Church of Satan after all the false allegations about Satanism that were made during the Satanic Panic. Or that we don't have enough problems turning away criminally insane people who hear voices in their head and they think Satan is talking to them, and they think the Church of Satan welcomes this. So see episode 28 of Satan's Plane for more information on that before I get too far off topic here. Like I said, there have been recurring patterns and phrases I have seen in this dim bulb behavior over the years, especially in the case of people who used to be happy and productive Church of Satan members and somehow became disgruntled ex-members. And at this point in the talk, I was showing a PowerPoint slide with a bulleted list of uh, some of the common accusations I've heard over the years. So some of the lines that I hear are, Oh, the Church of Satan isn't as fun as it used to be. Or, Oh, the Church of Satan doesn't do as much as it used to do. Oh, the Church of Satan hasn't done anything since Anton LaVey died. Oh, the Church of Satan doesn't get together with people like they used to. Oh, the Church of Satan is really just a website now. Oh, the Church of Satan used to believe in X, but now they believe in Y. Well, after hearing all of these phrases from whiners over the years, I suddenly came to a revelation about these people. That's not the Church of Satan you guys are talking about. That's you. You're talking about yourself. It's not that the Church of Satan isn't as fun as it used to be. You, you are not as fun as you used to be. It's not that the Church of Satan stopped doing things. You don't do as much as you used to with your life like you did when you were younger. Don't you see? You haven't done anything with your life since Anton LaVey died. You don't get together with friends like you used to when you were younger. You treat the Church of Satan as nothing but a website. You don't believe in the same things you used to believe. I know the term projection is an overused term, but that's what we're seeing here. So I've talked enough about spotlights and dim bulbs. Let's take a short break right now. When we come back, we'll finish with the third topic, and that is shine. You are listening to Satan's Plane. You are listening to Satan's Plane, real satanic talk with Church of Satan Magister Bill M., for questions, comments, and correspondence, send an email to bill at satansplain.com. In 1966, Anton LaVey created the Church of Satan. 
marking the beginning of the Age of Fire and year one Anno Satanus. In 1969, he published The Satanic Bible, codifying Satanism as a religion, the first time it's been done in human history. In the name of Satan, ruler of the earth, king of hell, come forth from the pit, bestow the blessings of hell upon us. For we are your children, and we invoke thee this night. In 2001, I was appointed High Priest of the Church of Satan. In 2007, I published the Satanic Scriptures, further defining and expanding on Satanic philosophy and greater magic ritual. Hail Satan full of might! Hail Satan full of might! Our allegiance is with thee! Our allegiance is with thee! Cursed are they! Cursed are they! The God adorers! The God adorers! And cursed are the worshippers! The Nazarene eunuch. For the past 50 years, the Church of Satan has stood as the sole organization to define and defend Satanism as a religion. And though pretenders to the infernal throne have come and gone, we have stood the test of time and will into the future. Visit churchofsatan.com for more information and read the Satanic Bible and the Satanic Scriptures. Knowledge is the solution for ignorance. Hail Satan! Hail Satan! Hail Satan! Magister Bill M. here with Satan Splains. Visit the official website for the show, satansplain.com. You can also email me with your questions and comments. Bill at satansplain.com is the email address. Besides the official website, there's also Spotify, YouTube, Audible, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, and more. Plenty of ways to listen to Satan's Plane. Also, please give Satan's Plane a like and a follow on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. If you enjoy Satan's Plane and would like to show some support, please consider bidding on one of my eBay items. This helps me a lot, as I have lots of wonderful stuff that's destined to find the right home. You can find the link to that on satansplane.com. So in celebration of one year of Satan's Plane, 40 episodes, I'm giving a Satan's Plane episode version, if you will, of a talk I gave at the Church of Satan's 50th anniversary, Spotlights, Dim Bulbs, and Shine. The original talk, if you can believe it, was not even 20 minutes, but rather than cram everything into, you know, that same time, I've been taking my time to give you a more detailed version of the same topics I talked about. So far, I talked about spotlights and dim bulbs. So now let's finish the episode talking about shine. Now, once again, I'm not saying that anybody who is not in the Church of Satan newsfeed, you know, not in the spotlight is somehow a dim bulb. Also, like I said, there is no obligation to share your work with other members in the first place. There are amazing members of the Church of Satan who aren't in the spotlight by their own choice. But... When I talked about this whole topic to a live audience, I had a screen where I was showing slides and other images, and one of the images I put up on the screen was this really, really hideous painting that uh, somebody had found online and showed it to me. And it was supposed to be a painting of Anton LaVey, but it was just really terrible. And the audience gagged, which was the expected reaction. But I showed the painting to bring up the following question. Okay, if Satanism is about meritocracy and shameless elitism and self-empowerment and all that, then why do we occasionally run into some people who call themselves Satanists and, you know, they show up on Satanism forums and they post crap like this? Or if it's not a crappy painting, then, you know, it may be a Satanist uh, who... It produces a book on Lulu, self-publishes, and the book has like typos in the title and every other sentence. Or maybe they produce a podcast with really terrible noise. Or, you know, who knows what it is. But you get the idea. And again, don't get me wrong. There is no shortage of Satanists putting out quality stuff, especially Church of Satan members, putting that stuff out and sharing it with other members. And that's great. But again, why is it 
that you'll be on a Satanism forum and somebody else will say, hey, I'm a Satanist and here's a satanic drawing I made. Hail Satan, we are legion. And it will be this doodle done on a torn piece of lined notebook paper. And it, 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 I don't know, I think it's like a dragon or is it a goat? I don't know, but it's all skewed to one side. And there's the pentagram and it's pointing the wrong way. And, you know, again, just like a terrible thing. So how does this happen in, uh, you know, a religion of elitism and so on? Well, I think a lot of it comes down to misapplied satanic principles, which you can once again trace back to one or more of the nine satanic sins. For example, the artist who drew that crappy picture, painted that crappy LeVay painting, and I guess I'm using the term artist loosely here, but anyway, you may ask them, okay, why did you paint this? And they may say, well, you know, I, I just paint for myself. It's for my own fulfillment. I mean, isn't Satanism about self-worship? I think it would be unsatanic to create something to try to please other people. So I painted this for myself. I write for myself. I make music for myself. Well, okay. That's valid, I suppose. There is something satanically to be said about doing self-pleasing things and not caring about what other people think. Okay, sure. But if you're doing this just for yourself, then why would you post it online? Why show other people? In fact, why would you post it on a Satanism forum of all places? Because Satanists, let's face it, you know, we tend to be very discerning and critical people. You say it's unsatanic to please people. Well, maybe a message board full of Satanists are likewise going to feel that they have no obligation to be nice to you and may have no reservations acting in a harsh way, criticizing your work. Or perhaps worse, think your work is so terrible, you know, it's not even worth commenting on. So, I suppose a distinction could be made between being an artist and being an entertainer, but I would argue that there is a bit of entertainer in every artist. I know artists don't like to hear this, but I do sincerely believe that on some level as an artist, you do have, have that feeling where you want to show the world your work, you want the world to see your message, and I think being an artist and entertainer has, is, is a sort of yin-yang relationship. So if I could get philosophical here for a moment, there's a bit of yin in the yang and yang in the yin. You know, there's a bit of artist in every entertainer, that passion to create something on some level. And again, I think there's a bit of entertainer in every artist. They may do it primarily for themselves and would still make art even if they were alone on a desert island. But uh, again, I think there's a part of every artist that wants to show their stuff to the world in some way. They, you know, want that reaction. And as long as you're going to do that, why not make the extra effort and make something you can actually take pride in? You know, your first draft doesn't have to be the final thing you, you upload and show the world. In Satan's Plane, episode number one, I talked about how Satanism is an RTFM religion. You know, read the fucking manual religion. And along with that, Satanists also have a do-it-yourself attitude, which is great. It's good to have that drive in general to uh, learn things on your own without expecting people to spoon-feed you the information or teach you how to do something. But I think there is a danger in that extreme, and it reminds me of a quote from comedian Mitch Hedberg, who said, I decided to be a self-taught guitar player, and I realized that was a bad idea because I didn't know how to play. I was a bad teacher. I would never have gone to me. So my point here is that the do-it-yourself attitude can sometimes wind up as counterproductive pride. Remember, the Night Satanic Sins again. If you play guitar or you want to play guitar, well, there is no satanic shame in paying for a guitar lesson. There is no satanic shame in learning something from an expert, somebody who is more experienced and more skilled at something than you. Again, if you have envy, then make that envy work for you. Well, I don't have money right now for art lessons. Well, for crying out loud, there's a wealth of information these days on YouTube, on the web in general. Countless books you could buy that's cheaper than a lesson. I know there are lots of people these days who think that learning something by the book or learning something formally from an instructor will somehow make the creativity less pure. And to that I say bullshit. Are you passionate about a certain skill? Would you 
rather be better at it than worse at it, well, then try using the resources at your disposal. I know that when I find a topic I want to learn, I usually end up buying and reading several books on the topic. Or again, learning may include talking to people who are experts in the same thing. Now, if you're a Satanist, maybe a fellow Church of Satan member, well, maybe another member can give you some pointers or insight. Satanists tend to be people who are really passionate about, you know, something or another. And so often you can find an expert on something within the Church of Satan. Now, the expert you find may not necessarily drop everything that, that they're doing and answer your email and give you free advice on something, especially if it's a service they normally charge for as a professional. But maybe if you're polite in asking, if you keep your questions short, you may get some answers. Especially if you show that you've already put in some effort to learning whatever it is, and you're not just expecting this other person to do all the work for you. In the tech world, for example, if you go to a forum and say, hey, my computer's not working, and you don't say much else, well, you're not really going to get much help. But if you say, hey, I'm trying to do this specific thing, but I can't get it to work. I've already tried doing A, B, and C, so does anybody have any other suggestions? Here's the model of computer I'm using. Here's the memory. Here's the specs. So something like that, you know, an expert may see that and say, okay, well, this guy's at least willing to meet us halfway. You know, maybe I'll help this person. But getting back to this idea I mentioned earlier of people saying, well, I don't care what people think of me. Yet another thing I've talked about in a previous episode of Satan's Plane. And there's a quote that comes to mind, a quotation from a book by comedian George Carlin. And that quotation is this. Most people who say they don't care what people think are desperate to have people think that they don't care what people think. And as Satanists, do we care what other people think? I know there are Satanists who are very quick to say, no, no, we don't. It's stupid to care about what other people think. But I would argue, well, it depends on what it is, doesn't it? Do we care about mass approval? No, we don't care about approval from the masses. We're Satanists. Do we care if a coworker doesn't like the same music or movies as we do? No. Who cares about that? But surely we care about what some people think regarding some things about us. I want my local police department to think I'm a law-abiding citizen. If I do something for a living, I want the people who give me money for it to think it's worth the money. I mean, this is just rational self-interest. Well, for that matter, you know, what about the whole entire topic of lesser magic? That's part of Satanism, and that's entirely based on getting people to think certain things about you when you think about it, really. Namely, in a way that benefits you. So for that matter, take this podcast as an example. Do I care what people think about Satan's plane? Well, I care in some ways. I don't care if I've offended some Christian who doesn't like what he hears. I don't care if some devil worshiper tunes in and doesn't like how I describe Satanism. I don't even necessarily care if there's an actual Satanist who doesn't like one thing I said in particular and that one Satanist makes a nasty reply. You know, that isn't even a good argument. I do, however, care that some people find this show worth listening to. I care that I convey my points as best as I can. I care that other Satanists in general overall hear what I have to say and get something out of it. This is a show I take pride in and I I put a lot of work into. So I care that the production value is good, you know, just the sound quality alone. For example, I spend a lot of time getting my sound to sound good to my ears, to sound decent at least. You know, I'm applying EQ and noise reduction and compression and all that. I've been doing this for 20 years, and I'm still never completely satisfied with the sound. But I still try, because I know I wouldn't want to listen to a podcast that sounded all hissy or or sounded like it was recorded on some crappy laptop microphone with the people standing across the room from it. I pay money every month to handle the you know, the distribution end of the show. And uh, anyway, there is, however, another problem, which is the exact opposite of all of this and something to keep in mind when we talk about shine. And the exact opposite of not caring is perfectionism. 
So on one extreme, you have the occasional person who pushes out a terrible painting or some other terrible project without putting any real effort into it. They're really solipsistic. But on the other extreme, you may have a Satanist who doesn't follow through with the things they're planning on doing. They keep thinking, well, this isn't really ready yet, or I just couldn't release it like that, or gee, you know, I'd like to do this kind of thing, but that would take much too much effort, and I don't have the skill for that. I'm going to be realistic. And they just never get around to doing anything. So that's a bad extreme, too. And that can happen to any of us. I've been hurt by my own perfectionism before. You know, so as probably any successful person, Satanist or not. I know that for every successful project that I have had, I have a dozen or half done projects that have been sitting on the back burner and just didn't go anywhere that, you know, I didn't put enough effort into. But uh, the sad fact is, if you wait for things to be perfect, you'll end up producing nothing. I'm really glad that Anton LaVey didn't wait until the Satanic Bible was perfect before he published it, or it may have never been put out. So I'm going to finish by saying a few more things about Shine. I know some of you listeners out there may have been thinking, yeah, those dim bulbs, they suck. You tell them, Bill. I can't stand what those idiots do. You know, they pop up on these Satanism forums and show their crappy paintings or their terrible music. Well... Before you condemn all of them so quickly, hang on a second. Because I have a question. It's a question for Satanists. Do you support the works of fellow Satanists? In fact, more specifically, if you're a member of the Church of Satan, do you support the work of other members? I suppose the answer is yes, because, well, here you are right now listening to a podcast. So you are supporting the work of... Of, you know, you're supporting my work and thus supporting uh, Church of Satan members' work. I thank you for that. But I've seen some other people who are really quick to condemn the newbie Satanist who has a crappy painting or a crappy essay, but at the same time, maybe aren't supporting the Satanists who are producing good stuff. So I asked the audience that day, rhetorically, do you support other members and the things that they're doing? Do you buy their stuff? Do you listen to their podcasts? I mean, we can't all spend all of our money and time on every Satanist project that pops up, and not everything is going to interest us. That's fine. But do you at least support some of them, especially if you want some support in return for what you do? And some might think, no, no, that's a Christian thing to think that we should always get things in return for what we give. That's solipsism. Well... Not quite. As I've said in the beginning, we, the Church of Satan, we are a mutual admiration society. So let me ask a more specific question rhetorically. Are you somebody who goes to a Satanism internet forum, makes a post advertising your stuff, you know, your project, your thing you're selling, whatever it is, and just leave after that? Never give any other posts in the feed a like or even read anything? And you never return to that forum again until it's time to make your next advertisement there? Well, be honest with yourself. Um, And if you do that, something to think about. And here are some more questions you should ask yourself. Do you offer constructive criticism? Or is any and all of your criticism done behind the person's back? Because I've seen cases where a Satanist, or more specifically a Church of Satan member, will create something... And somebody will complain about it, but they complain about it to everybody but the person who made it. Now, obviously, as a Church of Satan member, you are under no obligation to support the work of other members. Sure. If, say, some Church of Satan member has put out a a heavy metal album and heavy metal isn't your thing, well, yeah, don't support that project. You can choose not to. I know there are Satanists who've known me for over 20 years, maybe have even met me in person, and they've never listened to Satan's Plane. They've never listened to The Devil's Mischief. I've had some people say that, you know, podcasts just aren't their thing. Okay, fine. But if somebody makes something and you think the thing sucks and you tell everybody but that person who made it, that it sucks, well, then what will happen? Well, what 
might happen is the person who made that crappy painting will make more crappy paintings. The person who made the crappy podcast will make more crappy podcasts, and so on. And maybe it will continue this way until somebody says, Hey, I listened to your podcast and I thought, you know, the sound sounded bad in this way. And I think you can clean up your sound if you buy this and this or try doing this. Just a suggestion. Again, constructive criticism. You can tell the person with the painting, Hey, I liked how you used this color and this theme with your painting. But in my opinion, as an artist myself, I think the symmetry is off here and there. And you might want to try using this kind of shading here instead and so on. Satanists are their own god, and also as a god, I just want to say, demand more from yourself. Magic happens outside of the comfort zone. I know a lot of Satanists, including myself, don't like to hear that. We like to be indulgent in our comfort zones. Indulgence, not abstinence. That's satanic statement number one. But goals are sometimes outside of that comfort zone. So within the comfort zone, you have a standard of good enough. Then on the other extreme, you have perfection, which is the unreachable standard. Talked about perfectionism. So you want to chew for something in between. So don't aim for perfection. Don't settle for good enough. A key word I would say is shoot for being outstanding. At the very least, go the extra mile. Put in that extra $5 to get the slightly better business cards for your trade. Pay that little bit of extra money to get the stupid ad banners off your website. Buy a domain name. That's How about that? That's what I do. Don't use Linktree. Get your own .com. You know, I do that. I can say that the website, you hear me say it all the time in the Satan's Plane. It's satansplane.com. I don't have... To give you the show's URL as, you know, go to the website at Instagram.com slash 101023789 slash blah, blah, blah. No. I mean, imagine being handed a business card that says, you know, contact info, Anthony's Healthcare 123 at AOL.com. And there's a Staples logo in the corner where they got the card from. I mean, would you go to that doctor's office? I wouldn't. So what can you create and do as a Satanist. What are you passionate about? Don't think that anything that can be done in the name of Satanism has already been done because there are so many untapped things that we could be doing. We have this huge bedrock of philosophy and all these books and essays written by Anton LaVey and Peter H. Gilmore and countless other Church of Satan members over the years. Now, we don't need another heavy metal podcast. Thanks, but no thanks. Unless maybe you're doing something really unique that's different from the other ones. But again, there are so many other possibilities. How about getting together and filming some of the rituals from the satanic rituals? Even basic stuff like that. I don't see anybody doing that, really. That's an idea. I haven't seen anybody perform Elektrische Vorspiele on film. How about a satanic podcast on robotics and AI from a satanic perspective? How about a Pentagon Revisionism documentary? Again, there's so much you could do, and you don't have to do it alone. Find other Satanists who will get on board with an idea and do it. Some may even beg to be part of what you're doing, if they're crazy about the topic too. And in closing, I told the audience on that day that uh, these sorts of Church of Satan events, the 50th anniversary was in this case, definitely motivate me to get off of my ass and do more because sometimes I get in my comfort zone and I think I'm pretty hot stuff. I may rest on my laurels. But uh, then I see all the amazing stuff that other Church of Satan members are doing and I think, uh, shit, I gotta get back to work. And it improves my quality. It gives me a, a long-term indulgence and that pride that comes from completing a project. Likewise, I hope that you look at the other things that Church of Satan members are doing and it inspires you to do great stuff. It does for me. So thank you for listening. Be outstanding. Shine. Hail Satan. You have been listening to Satan's Plane. For more information about the show, visit the official website at satansplane.com. And for more information about Satanism itself, visit churchofsatan.com. 
This episode, copyright 2023, Magister Bill M.